And I am a trainer at Trinity Fitness Beachside in Melbourne and have been at that facility for about three years, but I've only been a trainer about seven months. And it was quite a stretch for me to, to commit to that for multiple reasons, mainly physical. Stretching is and, and strengthening are, are really new to me. I've been a runner my whole life. I ran all through college. But the working out and the working with the weights, the upper body stuff has never really been my forte. Plus, I'm the most inflexible kind of guy. They call me the Tin Man, but um, <laughs> you know. so it's been great. It's, it's been a real challenge being there, and, and I've really enjoyed it. So I'm a psychologist. I'm in private practice in Melbourne. I've been there for 29 years and love what I do. And I, I work with individuals, with couples, and I, I love being able to help people. And that's what we all, everyone in this room does. We're helpers, we're servers, which is fantastic. But sometimes we neglect ourselves in the process. Sometimes we overextend ourselves. And that's what I experienced about 20 years ago where I was burning the candle on both ends. So let me tell you about what happened to me. So I, I am married, been married for 27 years, have three daughters, God bless me with girls. <laughs> And I don't even have a male dog, okay? You know? Get by the day. <laughs> and that's why it's really important for me to have guy time. And I, I make sure I spend time with guy friends. But anyway, we're, we're heading up to New York City for Christmas. Now Christmas is a very stressful time for most people, but especially for my business. Because sadly, Christmas is a very difficult time for a lot of people. So I'm getting ready to go away for a week, and my patients are not happy about that. But I'm trying to work everyone in before I head out. Stressful time. At that time, I was serving as an elder in, at my church, so we had a lot of night meetings. I'm not sleeping very much. I'm not working out. I'm all caffeinated up because we've got this long trip. Get on the airplane. And about 40 minutes into the flight, I'm out. I pass out. So it's my wife and my two girls at the time. They're a mess. They're panicked. The flight attendant comes over, says, maybe we should land the plane in Atlanta. My wife's like, no, I, I think we probably need to go to New York. That's where our family is. And uh, you know, I'm sure she knew that the life insurance policy was paid up. But no, no, just kidding. Uh, Anyway, so we get to New York and, you know, my family's there and we, we take all the precautions and everything. I have all these tests done shortly after that event and they find it's a vasovagal syncope, which really doesn't tell you much. My blood pressure dropped, I passed out, but they really couldn't find a cause. Well, because it was stress induced. I was probably dehydrated, I was stressed out, I wasn't taking care of myself, and that's what caused this to happen. It was the perfect storm. So how many of you have been in that perfect storm scenario where you have overextended yourself and set yourself up for something bad to happen? Many of us do that. And, and it's all for a good cause. I mean, we're, we're helping others. We're helping our community, our church, our job. But we get to a point where we neglect ourselves. So why, why do we serve? Why do people serve? Well, we serve because we really do want to make a difference. Maybe we have a particular organization that we are passionate about, and, and so we serve for that reason. We want to make a difference. 
We want to impact other people's lives. We want to help others. Good reasons to serve, except when you get in a situation where you neglect yourself. We also serve because we, we want to challenge ourselves. And that was kind of my deal when I volunteered for the Trinity Fit Fitness training program, is I wanted to stretch myself. I wanted to learn new skills. And I have, and I continue to learn new skills. But a lot of us like the challenge. And I'm one of those individuals. I like a challenge. And I realize that I want to learn my entire life. I want to keep learning new things so I can be better and so I can serve others. And I know that God commands us to serve. From 1 Peter 4.10, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Everyone in this room is gifted in some way, shape, or form. And we're using our gifts as trainers at Trinity Fitness. And that pleases God. Now, there's, there's real advantages to serving. I don't know if you know this, but the research has found that volunteers, people who serve, live longer. And they live healthier lives, both physically and emotionally. So that's pretty cool. We have that little perk for serving. People who serve also find purpose and meaning in life when they're serving. I personally believe that when we serve, it keeps us humble. It keeps us centered. It doesn't doesn't become all about us, which is so easy for that to happen. It's so easy for us to think it's all about us when we're doing things. But when we serve, when we give back, it takes the focus off of us and puts it on others, which is a wonderful thing. It also pleases God. It pleases God when we glorify Him. So serving has many advantages. Even our relationships with the people that we serve are deepened. When you're serving together, you have a greater level of connection and a greater level of commitment to each other. Which, I am a relationship guy, so I believe that relationships are really where joy and happiness come from. I believe relationships are really the key to life. Whether it's a marriage, whether it's a friendship, whether it's your relationship with God. But it's all about relationships. And when you read the Bible, it's all about relationships in there. Some dysfunctional ones, but you know, God even uses those dysfunctional people to glorify Him. So it, be aware that when you serve, you're connecting with people that you might not have normally connected with. So the problem becomes when you overextend, when you overcommit yourself. And some of us do so much for others that we neglect ourselves and we're not even aware of it until we start to feel apathetic, where we really don't care. We were just kind of going through the motions and then we start to feel tired when we're engaged in this particular activity. Soon, anger develops. We're angry that we committed to this, that we signed up for this. And then it follows, it's followed by resentment. Resentment is anger with a history. <laughs> anger that's been around for a while turns into resentment. And the next phase of that is detachment. So now we start to disengage from the organization, from the activity. 
not good. And then we, we get negative, we get cynical, we get critical of what we're doing and the organization and the program. We feel unappreciated, devalued. It's not a good place to be. Not just for you, but for the organization. <clears throat> so it's important to be aware of that and to pay attention to those characteristics. Now, even Jesus needed some downtime. And this is from Luke 5, 15 through 17. But despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster, and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Jesus needed time to rest, to rejuvenate, and re-energize. He's our example. We need to take that time for ourselves as well. So I want to talk with you about three different types of boundaries. So the first one is physical boundary. And a physical boundary is kind of like your personal space or your property line. Think of it like there's a fence that surrounds you. And everyone has a fence, but you have a gate. And hopefully you're monitoring your gate. You're not allowing bad to come in and instead you're, you're taking good in and you're having bad leave. Some people don't do a good job at monitoring their gate. Sometimes the gate is just stuck wide open. Sometimes you have to ask a person to leave. Then there are those Boundary violators, they just hop your fence. <laughs> and you need to tell them it's time for them to go. Yes. <laughs> you need to set limits on people because they will take advantage if you allow them to. So our physical boundary is really important. It, think of like a door. If let's say your bedroom door is closed, or your bathroom doors closed, you want the person to knock before coming in. And you want them to wait until you say, it's okay to come in, especially if you have kids. You know, that's an important boundary that you need to set up. And it's a boundary that's important for life. The second one is emotional boundaries. So what is that? When people say stuff to you that is hurtful, that is mean, that is disrespectful. You need to call them on it. That's part of setting an emotional boundary. Now, are there times where you let stuff slide? Of course. I'm not suggesting that every time someone says something that you know, bothers you, you have to call them on it. But you need to be aware that a lot of times, if you just internalize that conflict or that emotion, it's not gonna go away on its own. And conflict is part of life. It's like taxes. You can't avoid conflict. It's what you do with it. So you have to decide, are you gonna just keep it in or are you going to let it out? Some of the people that I work with, the patients, they wanna keep it in. Because maybe nothing good came from conflict from their past. They saw conflict but there was only negative outcome from conflict. So they learned that conflict was bad. So now they avoid it like the plague. They put all their conflict in a box, put it up on a shelf, seal it, and hope that it doesn't fall. But every once in a while, the boxes fall and they make a big mess on the floor. And then they're left cleaning up the mess. So part of my job is helping people unpack their boxes. Because I'm telling you, people have a lot of pain that they're not dealing with. And that's part of what I do for a living, is help people deal with that pain so that they can let it go. I don't want people living in pain indefinitely. 
I want to give them tools and strategies to work through their pain so that they can let it go. The last one is, is spiritual boundaries. Spiritual boundaries is being firm and strong in your faith. And not allowing someone to tell you something different that you know, based on the word, based on the Bible, you know is incorrect. And being able to stand up for, for your faith and your boundary when it comes to your relationship with God. So it's important to have all three of these boundaries in place. Now, even the Good Samaritan had boundaries. You know, you think, oh, the Good Samaritan gets the guy up from, you know, the, the, the road, brings him into an inn, takes care of him. So the Good Samaritan soothed the wounds with olive oil and wine, bandaged them. Then he put the man on his donkey. Now, if he was a Trinity Fitness trainer, he just put him on his back, right? <laughs> he didn't need the donkey. Okay, but he took, the, took him to the inn, took care of him. The next day, he handed the innkeeper two silver coins, telling him, take care of this man, and if his bill runs higher, then I'll pay you next time I'm here. And he took off. He had a boundary. He said, I can help him for one night, but then I gotta go. I got things to do. So even the Good Samaritan set a boundary. And we need to set boundaries. We need to know that we can't be everything to everybody. How do we set boundaries? What does that look like? Well, obviously the first way is, is through communication. It's important that we communicate our needs to others through our words. Now, communication, you know, being assertive is being direct, being honest, being open. But communication is not just verbal, it's also nonverbal. 93% of communication is nonverbal. 93%. That's why texting is really not very good. <laughs> You can't have a conversation via text or a conflict via text and expect a good outcome. <laughs> because you don't get all the nonverbals. And by the way, the emojis, yeah, they don't, they don't. <laughs> Forget the emojis. I mean, that, you know, you're trying to express yourself via an emoji? No. So it's, it's important that you're aware of your tone of voice, your facial expression, your eye contact, your body language, because those matter. So many of the people that I work with say, hey, I can tell people what I think and how I feel. I'm very direct. Yeah, but your delivery is terrible. <laughs> so you may make an excellent point, but your delivery is horrible. So it's, it's not just what you say, but it's how you say it. We also need to work on setting limits and boundaries with people. And again, drawing the line in the sand and recognizing that there's only so much we can do. And we need to have expectations that are realistic and healthy when we're trying to help others out and do for others. So it may be something like, listen, I can help you for a couple hours, but after a couple hours, I got stuff I need to do, so I'm, I'm gonna have to leave. Instead of, I'll help you the entire day, and then I'm gonna be resentful that I just wasted my whole day <laughs> helping you. <laughs> because if we, if we overcommit, if we overextend, if we say no when we really, when we, if we say yes when we really mean no, that's going to cause resentment, and eventually it's going to cause detachment from that person. It's your job to set the limit. It's your job to be able to say no without guilt. 
And if you don't, you will lose self-respect. It's going to be difficult to respect yourself if you're always saying yes to everyone and everything. Remember this. I teach others how to treat me by the way I treat myself. I teach others how to love me by the way I love myself. If I put myself last, other people are going to put me last. Because they're going to just follow my lead. So I teach others how to treat me by the way I treat myself. And if someone can't accept your no, and you're concerned that maybe they're going to be upset with you, or they're not going to want to be your friend, then that really wasn't a strong friendship. If they can't accept your no, then that was, is not a friendship that will last. Finding balance in life. Again, it is sometimes very difficult to find balance because we're so busy. We live in such a stressful world and we're, we're constantly doing. In fact, many of us are more human doing than human being. Did you make that up? No. <laughs> and my wife will tell you that I am one of those human doing types. I have a hard time sitting still and not doing anything. Maybe it's because I don't feel productive when I'm sitting still, but she will constantly urge me to just be still and relax. And pay attention to your body, pay attention to taking care of yourself. Sleep is important. Your diet's important. Exercise is important. We all need downtime. So be sure you're taking care of yourself. Also, emotional support is so important. I surround myself with friends, with guy friends, because it's so important to have people that encourage you, that support you, but also that will call you out when you're going sideways. Guys need that. Not that women don't, but you guys are easy, you guys have an easier time with that. Guys are not good with that. But we need it even more because we struggle with this whole notion of, of relationships and being vulnerable and letting our guard down. But it's so important to have that in your life, to have those really important connections. So important. And the last one on this list is, is have a diversified life. So some people have all their eggs in one basket or two or three baskets. They have the work basket. They have the marriage basket. Maybe they have the children basket. Maybe they have the Trinity Fitness basket, but they only have a few baskets. I think it's important that you have 10 baskets and you scatter your eggs so that you have multiple sources of joy and fulfillment. Because if you lose one of those baskets and you only have a few, you're in bad shape. I have a hierarchy that I operate from. And here's how it goes. At the top of the hierarchy is God. God is number one in my life. That's the most important relationship that I have, is the one with Him. <clears throat> now number two may surprise you, number two is self. And so a lot of people think that's selfish. And it could be selfish if you're taking care of yourself at the expense of others. But I have number two because if I don't take care of me, then I'm not going to do a good job of taking care of others. It's like the oxygen mask on the airplane. Place the mask over your own face before you place over the face of your child. It's important that you take care of yourself. Now, it would be selfish if I took care of myself at the expense of others, that would be selfish. So one example that I use is I was a big racquetball player years ago, and we would play cutthroat 
two other guys, and we would play once a week. And this is when the kids were little, and often they had so many activities going on, soccer and this and that. So I would, I would talk to my wife on a Thursday night, and I'd say, what's the schedule for the weekend? I'd get the racquetball being in, but I would also be at those events. I would also be involved with my family. But it's important to take care of yourself. It's important to have a life where you're not just focused on everyone else and you're not doing a good job of taking care of yourself. So the next person on the list is your wife or your spouse. So it goes God, self, spouse, children, work, family, friends. And a lot of people have their, their spouse below their children. They have the children above their spouse. And that's a mistake. Or they have work above everything. Or they have themselves last. It's important that you have that hierarchy, that you're living that hierarchy. Now from 2 Corinthians, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. So if you can't give cheerfully, you need to question whether you're doing the right thing or you're in the right place. We are privileged to serve. We're privileged to serve others. But we need to do it wisely. And it's so important that we take care of ourselves in the process. So I need to wrap up. I know we just have a couple of minutes left. I will tell you that if I have some books available. This is my new workbook, small, small group study. It's a six week study and I even have uh, DVDs. Actually, they're Blu-ray discs. I need to emphasize that so people don't have a Blu-ray player. Uh, and uh, I have that for sale. I also have the book that I had published about five years ago called The Love Fight. And that's a relationship book. This study is a relationship study that I did at my church. And uh, that's available as well if anyone is interested. My website, I have blogs. I've been writing blogs for 10 years. There's probably over 500 blogs on there that you can check out. And I have podcasts from radio shows that I had done years ago. There's about 75 of those. So thank you all for being here. Anyone have any questions?